Morning. Welcome to Investment 360, your wrap of the top funds and investment insights in South Africa and beyond. I'm Bronwyn Nielsen, my co-host Warren Dick. Now joining us for the entire show is Adam Ibrahim, the CEO of Oasis. Remember to follow us on Twitter at investment underscore 360. First up, recent events in South Africa's unsettled labour environment could have had long-term implications for both business and labour. Businesses, for one, are being encouraged to automate and outsource abroad instead of helping to address the country's chronic unemployment problem. But how does this stack up with trends overseas? Adam Ibrahim from Oasis Asset Management in studio from Cape Town to discuss these issues. Well, Adam, let, let's start on this trend of automation and its impact on broader employment. I think South Africa has got a major issue. You've seen unit labour costs increasing by 154% over the last 10 years or so. That compares with Greece and Italy of about 50 and 60% and the US and Germany of about 18 and 26% in total. So we have become a very a high cost country and increasingly uncompetitive. And this is really as a result of low labour productivity poor equipment and inefficient equipment, high, lab, high government administered uh, expenses, and all together it's making our economy increasingly uncompetitive. What's very, very interesting, the private sector has not spent enough on new equipment, more efficient equipment, and labor saving uh, uh, equipment and also electricity saving equipment over the last 10 years or so which is a great surprise given the strong cash flows and strong balance sheets so i think the competitive situation in south africa and the high unemployment it's a combination of the public sector the private sector and the labor unions working against each other rather than working together Adam, we've got all these, uh, these institutions, uh, we have NEDLAC, we have uh, a range of mechanisms, we've got a very complex and well-regulated labour industry, but uh, it seems that the, the parties aren't pulling together. Is this, going forward, is this as much of a question of leadership around how each of the three come together and try and sort this out for the, the betterment of the country, or do you think uh, the status quo will just stay the same and we'll see this continual lapsing uh, and breakdown in relations to the detriment of everyone? I don't think it will stay the same. I think we're right in the eye of the storm at the moment. And if we just have to turn back the clock to Germany, and um, about 10, 12 years ago, the Germans had a social accord with, between labor, government, and the uh, private sector. And government did its part in deregulating the economy and protecting where necessary. Business invested substantially in um, new equipment and labor came to the party, a, a great industrial peace, great productivity. The net result is Germany is one of the most productive countries in the world, with most probably the largest export country in the world with China. And despite it being in a very unproductive Europe and very difficult Europe, so Germany through its reforms and social accord of 10, 12 years ago has managed to change the, uh, the, 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 uh, the situation. And I think if South Africans learn from the German experience on a social accord and we get around the table in a less formal way and the leadership of labor government and business get together and make some real big decisions for the benefit of all of us in South Africa Adam given the the situation in South Africa right now are you net positive or net negative so on the, in the on the general broad business environment I think hugely net positive and I'll talk about the negatives in a second. The net positive is we have a young growing population, we have rising incomes, we have a huge continent with really 900 people in sub-Saharan Africa growing at about 5% per annum and increasing its per capita wealth per person, which means that Africa will grow and increasingly that growth will become sustainable. And South Africa is idly positioned to, to participate and grow with Africa and being the leading player in Africa and the catalyst for that growth which will benefit our country. So, and that together with our local demographics, a low, a lower uh, poverty, rising wealth, I think South Africa is a, a fantastic place to be. Together with great 
rules and regulations, and a stable fiscal situation. The negatives are the negatives that we spoke about, and the negatives are really we have an unproductive labor force, we have inefficient equipment, and we have very, very high administrative prices and poor service delivery. So the, the problems are issues that we can solve by great leadership from all three sectors, and all of that is within our grasp. So but as it stands, as it stands positives outweigh the negatives. Warren, you want to jump in here? Yes, Adam. I mean, we talk about the, the negatives. It's, it's such a big thing, this labor issue, though. Is it, you know, can you form a thesis around this uh, from an investment case? In other words, uh, if you believe that employers now are incentivized to outsource uh, and, and automate, um, are you bringing that idea into portfolios in either the purchase of um, companies locally or abroad where they would feed into that trend? Because it does seem to be a trend. I, I don't know how you stem or persuade employers otherwise at this point uh, to try and encourage uh, them to employ more people. Uh, it seems that everyone we talk to is, is very hesitant about doing that and I think some of the stats that we're seeing uh, out of the labor force surveys we do uh, might indicate that as well. So is this enough of an idea to bring into the portfolio in some form or another? It's been a huge position in our portfolios over the last five years. Those companies that have continuously invested through the cycle have done fantastically because they've got modern equipment, they've got the most efficient equipment, and therefore the productivity and profitability is much higher than the competitors. So they're gaining market share, they're gaining uh, um, position in the market and gaining uh, cash flows. So companies like Omnia that has invested through the cycle, uh, um, Assor that's invested through, through the cycle have done phenomenally well. So we think that this is a theme. It's not only the labor issue, but it's also administered prices like electricity. And we believe that those companies that continue to invest will, uh, and invest to ensure that they remain competitive on a global scale will do fantastically. So we do not have a situation, for example, we prefer open cost mining to deep level mining. That means that you have less labor intensive operations, a company like Anglovol Industries, AVI, have continuously invested in more efficient equipment and AVI has outperformed the other food companies in South Africa mainly because of increased productivity in its operations. Can we, can we move to uh, another topic in terms of the gold industry and, and what we've seen on the gold price, sure. the recent sell-off and the impact that that has, sure. uh, has had on investors? Sure. Give us, give us your thoughts on the, the sell-off in gold, whether it's sustainable or whether sure. you see this just as a temporary sure. reprieve. Sure. I think, you know, the gold price recently has come down. Surprisingly, or not so surprisingly, it's come down after iconic investors like George Soros announced that they sold or reduced their gold holding. And the net result is that the herd came back and sold gold shares and gold bullion through ETFs amongst others, the net result is in a very short period of time, massive um, selling. Yet, if you look at the situation, we think this creates a fantastic opportunity from a long-term perspective. Firstly, the lower gold price is supported by high cash costs at the mines. In fact, the mines are running at cash costs of between $1,300 and $1,400 globally, with companies like Harmony at $1,600 an ounce. So the current gold price and the very low gold price will mean that there will be less gold produced at the mines. On the demand side, what's very interesting is on the demand side, ETF demand is, you know, uh, uh, investors who want um, to buy gold from a long-term perspective would get in now. Secondly, central banks are buying gold and the jewelry demand is picked up very dramatically. But let, let's take a step back. What is the most important driver for the gold price, in my opinion, in the long term? It's the flood of money in monetary policy that the most major economies like the US, Europe and Japan are doing. They're flooding the world with liquidity, debasing their currencies. So we actually think that this is a great, great buying opportunity for both gold, gold shares and the gold price. 
Adam, but I just got to understand that a little bit more and uh, before we go to the break, perhaps just to explain the, re the reason why you included gold equities there when you, you mentioned that some of the world's biggest producers were basically producing the gold at uh, uh, the gold prices below their costs uh, to deliver an ounce of gold. So why, why even use the equities? Should we not just be holding the gold ETF? I think that's a very good question. I think firstly I would have a position in the gold ETF. But the interesting thing about the gold equities, where they are, they've been in a 20 year slide relative to the gold price. And when you think that the gold price re increases, and the, these companies are now increasingly focusing on productivity and reducing costs, we think that going forward, the leverage to the gold price of between two and three for every 1% change in the gold price, you should see a two to 3% change in earnings or profitability of those companies and therefore the share prices. So we, for the first time, most probably in 10 years, we will start getting positive gearing of gold shares to the gold price. But, but Adam, so we're quite haven't excited. These haven't these gold uh, miners effectively been trying to increase productivity for many, many years? Uh, are they going to be able to do anything groundbreaking at this stage to alleviate the cost pressures that they're facing? We are talking about deep level mining at most of the major gold mines. Sure. I think if you look at the mining sector globally, not only gold mining, because you've been in this huge commodity bull market over the last 10 years, I think with increasing demand for equipment, increasing demand for people had meant that prices and costs in the mining sector as a whole has increased very dramatically. We see the mining sector as a whole cutting capex, including the gold mines, so there's less demand for labor, there's less demand for equipment suppliers, which in itself will start decreasing the cost pressures in the mining sector. And then secondly, the mining sector and the gold mining sector in particular, take Anglo Gold, have been spending a huge amount of money on new technology, the first new technologies in 25 to 50 years in the mining sector. And we should expect that new technology to ha start having an effect over the next three to four years. And that effect will be very dramatic for a company like Anglo Gold. And then finally, Anglo Gold is bringing on some very, very low cost production in Australia and also in the DRC. And it's been expanding its base. So if you look at the, uh, the, the weight between deep level mining and surface mining in a company like Anglo Gold, over the last five years that has decre decreased. And over the next five years it will continue to decrease. And then you should expect a significant re-rating from a company like Anglo Gold from a, a deep level miner to an, a basically greater surface level mining with a much lower cost. Adam, we're taking a short profile. break. We're coming back to you after that break. We'll see you in a moment. Sure. sure. Welcome back to Investment 360. The Oasis Crescent Equity Fund will shortly be celebrating its 15th anniversary and for good reason too. The fund, which is Sharia compliant, has trunched its peers, tranced its peers rather, with a 22.8% annual return since inception against an average of 15.2%. We continue our interview with Adam Ibrahim to find out where he's been finding value locally and offshore. Before we get to that, uh, Adam, I just wanted to come in there and uh, obviously ask get your uh, impressions around that outperformance uh, relative to your your peers. Uh, what do you put those? What do you put that down to? I think um, you know we really focus on building long-term value, long-term portfolios at very low risk. So when you take the performance of 22.8 percent, it's actually at very very low risk. We have a very high sharp ratio of 0.89, a very high Sortina ratio of approximately 1.5, and the downside correlation of this fund is most probably 0.6 to 0.7 relative to the competitors. So not only are you getting great long-term returns, in fact, 1 million Rand at the beginning would be worth 20, point, uh, 20 odd million rand, 20.8 I think. And secondly, if you put one million with the competitors, that would be worth eight, uh, eight million today. And that has been done at very low risk. So we take, we want to get the maximum return 
for every unit of risk that we uh, um, go into. And so when you look back, it's pretty pleasing that our strategy has worked over a 15-year period. In fact, that strategy has worked over a 25-year period. And the real focus is buying the best companies that you possibly can get with market leadership, profit leadership, cash flow leadership, and to buy that at below intrinsic value. And we continue to find those great opportunities both in South Africa and globally, both in equities and property. In equities and property. So let's drill down into the equity part of that equation, Adam. Where specifically in equities? Can you give me a little more color? Sure. So over the last 15 years, the, the cornerstone of this portfolio has been companies like Assol, Mediclinic, Omnia, amongst others. And over the last while, we've introduced companies like Rainbow, um, Anglo-American, Anglo-Ashanti, BHP and Sassel, and, and companies like Nampak. It, uh, that's a South African portfolio. We have approximately 25% of the portfolio globally invested. And a big chunk of that is the telcos in the US, Europe in, uh, in the UK, and in Japan. And then a big chunk of it also in the pharmaceutical companies, both the, both the telecommunication companies and the pharmaceutical companies have great cash flows, they have great market leadership. And the, you're buying them, we've been buying them at between 10 and 12 PEs, between four and six dividend yields with strong, strong cash flow. So if you take the South African mix with the global mix, Together with the odd property counter globally, we, you know, generating 6% earnings yield and dividend yield, that's been the cornerstone of our portfolio going for, uh, historically, and it's the cornerstone of our portfolio going forward. Adam, we just wanted to ask you about the, you know, the listed property, and it was something that you introduced in your presentation as, as you, you remain invested uh, there. Uh, with yields so low, though, what's, what's your argument for uh, buying listed property at this stage? Is it so, st something you're still accumulating in the portfolios? Yes, I mean, we, we're buying the best global property companies at six and seven and eight dividend yields at the moment. That compares to bond yields of 2.2 and inflation of 2.3. And we think that buying the best companies in the best cities, in the best sectors, with the best management, from a long-term perspective, is a great place to be. And secondly, if you look at those cities, we're mainly in the leading cities and leading sectors, healthcare, apartments, um, industrial. Um, a lot of those uh, sectors you haven't seen new supply come into the market. So you should anticipate the demand supply fundamentals for at least the next three to four years to be very, very favorable, ensuring that rentals increase, dividends increase, and cash flows increase. So we think that while um, the property sector globally and in South Africa has moved up very dramatically, we prefer our best asset class is global equities, and then our second best asset class would be global property. What sectors do you stay away from completely? I think the sectors that we kind of, that firstly we stay away from uh, uh, um, s companies that are poorly managed, who do not have a competitive advantage, and who are dependent on debt or alternatively quantitative easing. Some of the sectors that we have a very low exposure to globally would be the banking sector. Would, uh, um, the quality of earnings is very poor, very dependent on quantitative easing, very dependent on government support. In South Africa, we used to, 10, 12 years ago, we would add a very big exposure to the retail sector. In South Africa today, we have a very low exposure to the retail sector. They've done so, so well, very high earnings, very high PE ratios, and you know, we just think that given the situation that we spoke about earlier, where the labor situation, you know, you need workers, it would turn that into shoppers. And if you've got a problem with the amount of unemployment and high wages, we think that 
um, the situation that we will not be able to be a affording the a huge consumer spend that we've had over the last 10 years. So I think we've used this, uh, this fantastic upswing from about 2001 in the uh, retail sector to reduce our exposure to virtually nothing. Adam, I just wanted to come back to that listed property uh, idea of yours and, and obviously, uh, pardon my ignorance, but uh, we understand the fund is a, is a Sharia compliant fund and it can't invest in institutions that earn income from, from uh, receiving interest. So uh, my first question is, one, does uh, your exposure uh, in lieu of that uh, to real estate almost act as a quasi exposure to uh, financial instruments of uh, or financial in, um, institutions of some type and the second one relates to um, also what you've talked about uh, in many of the world's cities there's still urbanization taking place uh, lots of population requiring inventory in the form of, of buildings and infrastructure where does that leave your thesis around uh, resources because uh, it seems that the markets might have overdone the, the sell off in resources and, and the so called end of the uh, resource super cycle? Sure. I think firstly on, um, on the property side, we look at property as an income generating alternative. So we want a very lowly geared property portfolio and we want uh, properties that are in the best locations. We've done very, very well out of healthcare, uh, both in the US and places like Singapore. We've done very, very well out of apartments in places like Germany. And we think that um, you know, demand is picking up very gradually. And um, you know, we're also very big on what they call big data. So we have the world's largest data center company in our portfolio. So that really diversifies the portfolio very nicely with secular growth themes of big data, healthcare, and um, the thing, the opportunity that you mentioned about resources. As the demand picks up and the gap between demand and supply diminishes, so the vacancy rate decreases, you're going to have, you're going to see one, increased bill because of just pure demand and supply, and two, the continued point that you made of increased urbanization. And all of those uh, building items, many of the building items require resources like cement, like copper, amongst others, and steel and iron ore. So we think that, well, maybe the very high commodity prices are a thing of the past, but we think that the reasonable commodity prices over the next 5, 10, 15 years with cycles will be the place to be. And if you can buy those companies and those commodities cheaply, I think you'll be making lots of money. Adam, just I uh, want to drill down into your view on these gold stocks. You've spoken of Anglo Gold Ashanti, which you are expecting, I assume, to, to re-rate. Does the same hold true for the likes of Harmony? Where is your gold exposure? In our commodity exposure, including gold, we only invest in low, uh, low risk, low cost producers with substantial resources, uh, both from a commodity point of view and from a management point of view. When we look at a company like Harmony, Harmony is on the other end of the spectrum. It's always been a high cost producer. So you actually have to pay the gold price thesis that if the gold price really runs, Harmony does well. But what happens if the gold price is stagnant? You do not want to lose a substantial amount of your money. So we prefer the low cost producers like Anglo Gold. We prefer the low cost producers like Assol. We prefer the low cost producers like BHP Billiton. And we uh, uh, try not to have um, high cost producers in our portfolio in that way we mitigate the risk of having exposure to the resource sector where you are unable from a long-term perspective very accurately to predict where um, the commodity price is going to be from a five, ten year point of view. Just one, uh, one other question there. I didn't hear any, uh, any mention of platinum there, Adam, so I just wanted to find out what your view is on, on that metal in particular and obviously some of the companies are, uh, listed on the JSC that are, that are platinum producers. We think the fundamentals for platinum is really favorable, mainly because the South African platinum sector is predominantly a deep level sector with issues around productivity. So the supply constraints and the high cost of the South African platinum sector 
will mean that over time the platinum price will drift up uh, because most of the platinum is produced in South Africa other than Russia and a bit in Zimbabwe and recycling. So South Africa is the dominant player and therefore from a long-term perspective as demand picks up um, the price will, be re uh, will reflect um, some of the underlying trends in South Africa. We are invested to a small way in Impala Platinum, but we invested much in a more significant way in a small new platinum, uh, um, open cast platinum player, uh, Platman, um, which is part of the Palinger stable. So we invested both directly and indirectly in, uh, uh, in Platman. Uh, um, and interestingly, the last time we bought Platman on the Canadian exchange, we paid 11 Canadian cents. And the IDC invested 3.2 billion rand a few months ago at the equivalent of 101 Canadian cents. Well, that, so that we puts things that, into perspective. Uh, Adam, I'm afraid we're out of time, but thanks so much for chatting to us this afternoon. It's Adam Ibrahim, CEO of Oasis, and that's it for Investment 360 this evening.